Welcome back, everybody. And the topic today is the last topic in this uh, deep learning uh, block of uh, this course here. So last week, we were a little bit unfortunate in the sense that this uh, lecture hall was occupied by uh, the annual uh, teachers program. And I was not aware of that. And I think many of you were not aware of it. So we ended up just doing uh, project work. And uh, I have a recording, which is from last year. It's actually split in two uh, recordings. And you should have access to that from, for convolutional neural networks. Now, convolutional neural networks uh, are, and as you can see from the material we have from the previous week, they are ways to where we are going to, where we can reduce the dimensionality of the problem by applying specific filters. So if you have an image of a, a house with a 200 times 200 pixels, you can reduce the dimensionality of this image to smaller dimensions, which then can be treated in a standard feed forward neural network. Now this filtering process is done through the mathematical process of convolution. Now today, uh, although we were unfortunate last week and we did not have the time to run the lecture, uh, I will still start with recurrent neural networks. <laughs> and these are widely used in uh, analysis of time series, for instance, and also in natural language processing. So th there are uh, three main, main types of uh, deep learning approaches on supervised data. So one is a neural network, which you are working on in project number two. And as you've probably seen, we have extended the deadline till next Friday. Then we have convolutional neural networks, which in a way you could say paved the way for the deep learning revolution because convolutional neural networks applied to imaging has been an enormous success. And if you're looking at face recognitions or recognition of images and so forth, then this kind of uh, filtering process where you reduce the dimensionality through appropriate filters and the mathematical process of convolution gives you a problem which is more tractable. Now, what you should keep in mind is that this kind of filtering process is something which is often tailored to specific images. So if you're dealing with the uh, uh, recognition of houses, images of houses, when you have a house, you would often assume that the color is pretty uniform. And then you would just uh, uh, filter away many of the color informations and just leave out informations about the corners of the house, where the roof begins, uh, where the windows are, where the doors are, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one specific filter. If you're dealing with uh, uh, applications to some specific problems in the physical sciences, it may happen that you would like to filter away some noise. That is also a pretty common strategy. If the data are very noisy, maybe you have a way to filter out the noise. And that would also reduce the dimensionality of the data which you have. So uh, just to bring this back to the project number two, if you look at your neural network, uh, this is a, essentially it is a repetition of matrix matrix and matrix vector multiplications. And if you have uh, lots of data, that means clearly that your matrices are going to be pretty large. So typically if you have a uh, hundred input nodes and hundred hidden nodes in the first layer, that will give you 10,000 weights to train. And these will be represented by matrices of dimensionality hundred times hundred. So you actually have to perform multiplications of matrices of that dimensionality. And that starts taking time. So if you have a square matrix of dimensionality n times n, then the matrix matrix multiplication of two such square matrices require n cubed floating point operations. So if you have 100 uh, matrix elements or rows that, and 100 columns, that would give you 100 to the power of three floating point operations. And if you then have a matrix of uh, dimensionality 10,000 times 10,000, that means 10,000 to the power of three floating point operations. And this is one of the reasons why convolutional neural networks uh, have become so popular because the filter is often tailored to the specific problem. 
So uh, although we were unfortunate, I'm not going to discuss convolutional neural networks and I will have to uh, send you guys back to the videos which we have. I uh, hope you can forgive me for that. And actually the room was taken last week. But uh, what I'm going to do now is to go uh, into recurrent neural networks, which is also something many of you may encounter as, as a method for your, let's say your master thesis work. For project number three, uh, you should feel free to use these methods, both convolutional neural networks and uh, recurrent ones. And then I would normally recommend that you use TensorFlow as a tool, as a library, or PyTorch if you're more familiar with PyTorch. So the last project is more uh, oriented towards you having a data set you want to analyze. And then we're going to analyze that with the tools which we have available. And the tools we have available are essentially the methods which we have covered through the semester. The last two weeks of the semester, we are going to discuss uh, what is normally called decision trees, random forests, and methods based on that. We will also keep the lab open in the week of uh, November 27th to December the 1st. So for those of you who wish to, you can come to the lab sessions, but we won't have a lecture on Thursday the 30th of November. But the lab will be open. So in case you want to come and discuss uh, project three, which will be available this weekend, uh, then feel free to do so. I will send a message about that through Canvas as well. Any questions to these practicalities? So I wanted to say now some, i give you a quick example of how and how we can use recorded neural networks. And this example is applied to a very simple case so I have a sine function, which depends on time. And I'm going to produce a thousand outputs. This is gonna be the data I want to train against, but I will only make a training on the 81st percent of the data. That means the first 800 points. And then I'm going to train a recurrent neural network. And then I'm going to use that one to make a prediction on the remaining 20%. So you could say that you have some data up to a specific time, and then you train a network, which then allows you to make predictions beyond the time you train the network for. This is a typical application of uh, recurrent neural networks. And the way you can think of this is in a more general way, if you think of a time series, uh, suppose you are uh, being part of a survey of people who suffer from diabetes, just to give an example. And then you would, uh, every week, you would uh, go to your personal doctor and that doctor would uh, make a test on your skin because there's many people who've been doing research on diabetes have tried to see how the skin and the way you sweat uh, is influenced by people having diabetes or not. So what you could measure then is the, the way you sweat or the heartbeat or whatever at a given day. And then you repeat this the next week, the next week and so on. And then you have a data set. And that would define what's normally called a time series. And then you would train a model on that time series. And with that trained model, you would like to make a prediction for the next time and so on and so on. This is a typical example of how you would use recurrent neural networks. Now, the bad case with new recurrent neural networks is that they are extremely data greedy and also computationally very involved because we're going to deal again with uh, dense matrices and that clearly slows down the uh, performance of many of these methods when you have lots of data. So these are things to keep in mind. And so let's uh, take a quick look at uh, a simple example. So let's just uh, go uh, through the topic which we had during the lab sessions. And uh, let's take a look at the recurrent neural network. So uh, if we include uh, these methods, then we basically have the uh, main family of uh, deep learning methods. So this recurrent neural network is actually pretty close to what you have been coding now as a feed forward neural network. 
but it has connections with perhaps some external data or some external input at a given time. As I said, the case with the with the patient going to the me, to the doctor every week and making a measurement is a typical example of where you have an external probe which interacts with you. It gives an output, and then you keep training uh, or you keep doing these experiments weeks after weeks, and then you would have the uh, a time series of data due to an external input, and then the specific output you get that specific day when you run the experiment. So uh, this has been actually used in analysis of stock prices to find eventual regularities there. It has been used in uh, autonomous, it's actually used in autonomous driving systems. It's used in natural language processing. But uh, for us doing natural science, a very typical case we end up with is the analysis of experimental data over time or just time series. That's a very typical application case of recurrent neural networks. But it's uh, something which is widely used in many, many different applications. Now, in this case, and uh, uh, as we did also in convolutional neural networks, I'm using TensorFlow. And uh, TensorFlow here, I'm setting up the uh, number of layers I want to include. I have a sequential model. I'm using a simple RNN. So that means uh, the simplest possible algorithm, which we will describe now. Uh, one of the problems with uh, recurrent neural networks is the time dependence. And that time dependence can actually lead to long-term memories, and that can influence the performance of the network. Especially, this is a system which is extremely sensitive to exploding gradients, unfortunately. And you will see that in some of the calculations we're going to run here. Now, in this case now, I'm uh, setting up a function with 1,000 points. And you see now my function is just a plain sign function. Not, uh, nothing fancy here. And uh, I'm now actually going to train my recorded neural network with the first 800 points. And then the remaining 200 are just going to be a prediction. So I convert my matrix, uh, my train X and train Y, my test, so the test and the train are now the test cases, so the 20% last numbers, the last 200. And then the train is just the 800 first numbers. I'm setting up a uh, sequential uh, model. I take the simple recurrent neural network. Uh, I'm going to define, uh, to, to define some of these uh, quantities, what they actually mean a little bit later. Uh, the activation function is something you have encountered in many, many cases. Then I have some dense layers inside the recurrent neural network. And finally, I'm calculated the mean squared error, and I'm using the root mean square propagation as the uh, optimizer. And these are all quantities which you have seen. So the back propagation is also used here, but it's then called back propagation in time. That's the gonna be one of the main differences. So everything you've been doing with the neural networks applies to this case as well, except that now uh, we are going to back propagate in time. And you will see explicitly later how this takes place. So I can run this and uh, uh, you will now see one of the things which is nice with TensorFlow. So these are the calculations I've done you can actually find the number of parameters in the different layers which you set up. So the number of parameters in this case is not very large. So you have totally something like 1400 parameters to train. And then uh, when I run through this, the uh, uh, you see now that the loss function, this is all the total error, which I have for the mean squared error in this specific case is actually not that large, 10 to the minus four. And in this case here, this would be the function I've been training on. And um, training up to here, roughly. And then the rest, the orange line is actually my prediction. And the blue line is my uh, uh, training data, which I have, or the data I want to reproduce. So I'm basically training up to 800, which means here. And the rest is just a prediction. So for such a nice sign function, uh, this model does pretty well. 
if I were to add some noise to this, then life is not going to be so nice anymore, as you also have experienced in basically any of the projects you've been running. So if I, I let this run now, uh, just let it run, and then you will see that my train model is not that good anymore because I have lots of noise in the data. So this is a typical case we will end up with, irrespective of uh, almost uh, machine learning method you're applying or using. And you see now that the loss function or the loss or the difference uh, between the uh, data you're training and the data you want to reproduce is actually uh, still pretty large. And it's not going to decrease beyond some point three actually. And uh, somehow my laptop has been running slowly in the last two weeks because this is normally a pretty easy case to run actually. Uh, and I don't know why, now it should be done. Yeah, this is the last one. And here we go. And you see now that uh, my model or the data is actually the blue data and the orange one is actually what my model gives. And with noise now, the uh, reproduction of the data is not that good. But this was in a way expected. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch over to the uh, to the whiteboard because I wanted to discuss some of the technicalities with the recorded neural network, if that is okay. So let's just slow down the pace a little bit and bring this up. And then just switch to the whiteboard. So when we look at the recurrent neural network, what is often very convenient is to employ what's normally called a graphical representation. So often when you represent these networks and you've seen that with neural networks, we are using graphs to represent the network and you can uh, represent mathematical operations in terms of uh, these kind of uh, graphical images. So what you would typically have if we now look at a graphical uh, representation, which uh, often is very convenient. And this is pretty common both for convolution neural networks and uh, recurrent neural networks. So you could now think of uh, a mathematical operation. Suppose you're multiplying X with Y. So you would write it like this, and this produces an output Z. So this would be a multiplication. So let's just write multiplication here. Or you could just put the cross sign for multiplication. So you would then write, this would be an equivalent of writing Z times X times Y. This doesn't look like a simplification at all. But if you think of a neural network, the way we represented that one, uh, the output, was through a function, which we normally call the activation function. And then we had an X transpose times a W plus some bias. And this is something we would rewrite in terms of this variable Z here. So if you want to write that one in terms of a, a graph, what you would have then would be X and W as the inputs. So you perform the matrix multiplication so this is where you would take X transpose times W. Now this one feeds in to a function, which we call Sigma, but this also gets, so here we would have a matmul. So matrix, matrix multiplication. And then we would have a plus here because we are adding the bias into as an argument. So we have X transpose times W plus B, and that produces an output, which we call Y. So this is one way to represent graphically a uh, neural network. I mean, one of the specific nodes or outputs which we're dealing with. And then you can make this more and more complicated. 
Now, the way you can think of a recurrent neural network is more in the following way. So we could think of a dynamical system now. So think of a dynamical system. which is now driven by some external signal, by an external signal. At a time, let's now say at a time T. So time is a natural quantity uh, which we introduce in these kind of networks. So what you would say now is that there is an output at a given time T which we call S of T. And that is given by some function, which we haven't defined. And that receives as input what we had previously. There is some external uh, probe, which feeds into this function. And then there are some parameters theta. So theta are the typical parameters which we need to define. So this is a pretty generic setup of a uh, function which receives some kind of input from a previous value. And then there is, a, let's say, an interaction at a given time t, and that produces an output. So the way you could graph this now is that you would start at some time, some remote ancient time, which we call S0. And this propagates. And then at a given time t, we have this function f, which receives in here s t minus one, and it has an input here, which we call just x of t. So this function then produces a new output, and this new output would be s of t, and then that feeds into the new function f, the new data, and then we have a new x of t, uh, so this would be x of t plus one, and then this produces now an st my plus one, and that goes in here, new function again. And then I have a new external probe, xt plus two here. And this continues till your final time. So I'm putting an s of f here, an f for final. So this could be a series of measurements which have been done. Let me give you a very simple example of uh, an application of this kind of graphical uh, graphical uh, representation of a set of operations. So let's look at a differential equation, which you probably have seen many, many times before. So let's look at a simple example. So one example which you probably have seen is this famous differential equation of dt Newton's law. And then there may be some kind of velocity dependent uh, damping factor. And then we have some kind of uh, T dependence here. And then there is an external force. So F could be an external force now. And then you would typically, when you solve this equation here, you would discretize. So you would have an X at T zero. These are the initial conditions. You have a V zero, and this would be V at T zero. And normally the way you solve this equation is actually to rewrite it as two couple differential equations. So you would rewrite as two couple differential equations. And this is probably something you have seen many, many times. So let's say now that we just want to focus on velocity. We take only velocity now. Eh? So focus on velocity, on the velocity. And then we would have an equation where we have that V of T is actually given by the derivative of dx of dt. And then I also know that the uh, derivative of dv dt that's the position. 
And that's going to be given by this factor N divided by the mass multiplied with V minus X divided by the mass plus this F of T. So I'm just dividing out the mass here. And this is my differential equation here. And this is something which I could call for a function of uh, the force of X and V, okay? So uh, the only thing I did now was just to rewrite everything as two coupled differential equations, because I know that the position is a derivative, no, the velocity is a derivative of position. So we have uh, this equation here, something we know by definition. And then that means that when I look at this expression here, this is actually dv dt. So this one divided by, and I divide out m. So then I have a differential equation for dx dt, and I have one for dv dt. And this allows me to use the simplest possible method I could think of, which is uh, Euler's method. And then I can integrate up starting at time t equal to zero. So if we do that, then I get a uh, recipe, which is gonna look, so if I look at, suppose now I just focus on the velocity, I'm just interested in this term here. Then when I discretize, and this is a typical approach you would do, you discretize and you have X of I, and you have V goes over to V of I, and typically you would have I, which is the, determined in terms of the number of time steps you have. And you would have a time step delta t, which is just the final time, tf, minus the initial one, divided by the number of integration points you have. And your t of i would simply be the t0 plus an i times a delta t. This is a pretty straightforward discretization scheme which probably you have seen tons of times. And I hope you don't get offended if I repeat it. Okay, so uh, the, uh, what we can do then, when we use Euler's method, the simplest possible scheme for integrating up, Euler's scheme or Euler's method, or it's also called Euler's explicit method, or Euler's forward method. So we would have a time a i plus one, which is given by the previous time, plus delta t times the velocity. And then if I look at the velocity v of i, this is now given by v of i plus delta t plus this function f of i. So if we go back a little bit, this function f of i is actually this quantity here. So what I'm doing now, I'm just plugging in the derivative of the velocity. And that is given by this specific function. So this function, this f of i, is nothing but our function f evaluated at this external probe of force which we put on the system at the position x of i and at the velocity f of i. And if I want to make a graph of this, what I could do now is simply to set up the following uh, scheme we would then set it up like this. So we would have a V zero, and that feeds into this function F one. And that receives as an input, which is given by F one and also X one. So there is a position X one, which we now just think of as an external parameter. And then you're acting with a force on the system. So we can leave out, I'm going to leave out the axis in what is coming. Now this produces an output. And this output uh, produces a V1, okay? So you could now think of you making a measurement at time T1. And at time T1, you have a force which acts on the system and it produces a velocity V1. So you could think of you recording that velocity now. Now, in our case, this V1 is actually used as an input into the next time step. So this would be time T1, and then we have time T2. So I have an 
F2, I'm just skipping X now. So I'm, and that produces a V2 here. But this V1 is also fed into that one, which is used as an input. If you now look at your function F, that depends on these previous values. And that's why I'm putting in this V1 here. And that continues all the way to the final time. So V final here. And then there will be inputs of an F3, of T3, and etc. And that produces a new output, V of three, and so on. Now, this is actually something which is pretty close to the way you would train a recorded neural network. It's not that different, except that now, instead of me having the differential equation solver, which specifies this function f. So just remind, remember now that what I am doing, I am having this function f here, which depends on the external force, the position and the velocity. So this function here now is something which we will replace by a neural network. So the way we are going to update these variables will now be represented in a more, how to say, abstract way by the parameters of a neural network. And this neural network, which we're gonna plug in at every time step, is something which can be a simple neural network with one hidden layer. It can be a convolutional neural network, et cetera, et cetera. So you can make it more and more complicated. But you see the basic philosophy? So if you, if you see what's going on here, you could now think of you, and this is a, a potential example for a project, the final one, you could actually use your favorite differential equation solver, and you could produce these points F1, V1, et cetera, and think of them as outputs and inputs at a given time, T1, T2, T3, et cetera. And then you could train a network on this data and you could use that train network to make a prediction for new times. And then you could compare with eventually analytical solutions, or you could compare with the numerical solution. Are you familiar with runge kutta methods, things like that? That's a, just a kind of basic method for solving this type of differential equations. So you could think of the uh, T1s, F1s, V1s, etc., as your variables which you get with a runga kutta solver at every time. You could spit them out, and then you could ask the network to train and see if you get the same results when you make a prediction beyond what you train the network on. So that would be a very typical application of uh, neural networks to differential equations. And this is actually used. There's a big field in uh, natural science, which is often called physics or physical science informed machine learning. And if this is something which interests you, this, there are several groups at the university here which actually do work on that one. And there are several students doing their master thesis on topics like this. But let's now try to uh, uh, rewrite this one. So what you will often see is that this will be rewritten in a more compact form in the following way. So we have a compact rewrite, which uh, looks something like this. There is a V here, there is an input. And in our case, the input uh, will also depend on the position X. And then you will see a loop, closed loop like this, where you have a function F, and this is often marked with this box here. So that is just to indicate that you have this loop. And what you see up here, here, this is actually us, opening this up. So you could even think of this as you having done physical measurements and at every time step, you do have an observation, an output from the experiment you're running. And then you collect this data and then you want to train a network on this data. So that's uh, what we might say is the essence of a convolutional neural network. No, sorry, a recurrent neural network. And the uh, basic approach which you would have then when you're setting this up 
if we now uh, continue this example on uh, with with the velocity thing, when we now are setting up the simplest possible recurrent neural network, so a simple recurrent network. That could be something which looks like this. So I would have a, a, something like a V0, that's my initial value. And this feeds into this F1. There is an external input, which now contains F1 and X1. And I'm just gonna rewrite this. So there's a V1 and that feeds into F2. And then I have some F2 with X2, and that keeps feeding into an F3. So I have my V2 being sent out here, and then I have my F3, X3, and this continues to the final value, which I call for an F of N, which is the last point I have. And this has an F of N and an X of N. And this sends out an output V of N. This sends an output V3. This sends an output V2 here. There is an output V1. And this goes into a loss function. So let's call this a function L1. And then we have an L2, an L3, et cetera, up to an L of N here. And that receives an input, which could now be a target value. And so I'm going to put this as a T tilde, T1. So you could think of this as an observation you have made. I'm feeding this observation into a loss function or cost function. And then I have a series of such observations here. So there's a new observation, a T2 tilde. I just want to distinguish that from time since time is such a natural way of thinking of things here. And then I have a T n tilde. So the T tilde, they are the observations at a given time, T, T of i, observation at time, T i. You could also think of this instead of observation, you could think of this as target, or output values, et cetera, et cetera. We've been using different names when we've been naming these quantities. So what you could have here could be your differential equation solver, or it could actually be some measurements you're making of the velocity of a given system. And you know the force, you know the position, and then you have a model which then produces the output. So this model could be your differential equation solver or it can be your recurrent neural network. So let's now switch over to a recurrent neural network. So I hope you see the, uh, the kind of overarching picture here that what we plug in into these Fs, the small Fs, that could be any kind of model you're using for solving a problem. So in this case of a differentiation, that will be the recipe for the differential equation. And if in for the velocity will be the derivative of the velocity at a given time t, which then depends on an external force and another parameters. Okay, so uh, with this kind of uh, uh, way of thinking, what we are going to do now is to replace the part which we see here. So this part here, we are going to replace that one with a neural network, or what we are going to call a hidden layer. So what we do now is to, now we replace. Place the function f. With a neural net. With a given number of hidden nodes and hidden layers. So we are going to define a function now, instead of this function uh, V, which we had, I'm simply going to define this as a function H at the time T or at the step T. And this depends on a function F, which now depends on the previous input. It depends on some variable X of T, a generic variable. And then 
there are some sets of parameters. So these are the set of parameters we want to train. The compact way of writing this is as follows. So we would have something like these H's here. And then we have this function F here. And that produces an output Y with a given input X. Now, when we open it up, it's gonna look like as follows. So we're gonna open it up. And then we're gonna have the following image, which we can uh, rewrite here. So we will have something which looks like an uh, H of H zero, which we start with. And that feeds in to a specific function here or this H one. So what I'm doing now is actually to suppress this function F. So what I'm doing now is that I produce a function H uh, of uh, one, H of two, etc. This receives an input, uh, which I call for x1. And this produces an output, which is y1. And then this feeds into h2 here, which also has an input x2, an external input. And then I have a y2 here. And this continues all the way to the final one. And this is an h final, or which I write like an h of n. And then I have a Y of N, and here I have an X of N. Now, the way we are going to write this now is as follows. So we are going to set up uh, a set of parameters for the training. So H now would just refer to some hidden part. So H of I refers to hidden parts. which means that uh, these are things which we don't see when we look at the input and the output. And that's the same as you would have with a neural network. You have an input and you have an output. And what is in between is what does the black magic for us. So here again, we are going to have what this is in between as a neural net, the hidden layers. So the output and input layers are as before, except that now we would have neural networks at every stage and we would have to train parameters at every stage. So how can this look like? So let's uh, uh, break this uh, down a little bit. And the way we could think of that is that these parameters now, theta, they have some parameters defined by matrices, U, V, W, and V. These are matrices. And hopefully you can see that these are uppercase letters. And then there are some biases, B and C. So these are gonna be the parameters which we are going to train. And often what is done in a, such a training is that you would share the weights and the biases from one step to the other one. Because if you change them for, for every single step, that is gonna be a massive training process. So it's pretty common to deal with what's called weight sharing. Let's see now how you would set this up. So the way you would set it up now is as follows. So we start with this H0 and that feeds into this H1. Now, when you look at X1 here, there is a matrix U which is being used. So that means that this produces an uh, input set one, which is given by U of X1 plus some weight W multiplied with the previous uh, case. So if we do this in a more general way, we just put this at time T and then we have a time T minus one plus some bias. So that means that there is gonna be a weight here, which links uh, with the previous uh, information we had. So we have some initial values for the weights and the biases and that produces an initial weight matrix. And these are weighted by uh, the output of the layer, HT minus one. And then this is sent up to uh, an output, 
but this is modulated by a new weight matrix and that produces a Y1. So what happens then is that this H of T, which we produce is given by this function F of C of T as before. And this can often be actually in recurrent neural network. This is often a tan H. It's quite often or relo. And these are functions you have been training now with your network. And then this is going to produce uh, a quantity, which I call for R of T, which will be given by this new matrix V times H of T plus a bias C. So this is a bias. And this is also a bias. And then finally, I have my Y of T, which is given by some function. And this is my output function. And this is now a function which takes as input this R of T. So the parameters I need to train now are the weights of these three matrices, which link everything. And it supposedly is going to do the black magic for us. And then the biases B and C. So these are the set of parameters which I would end up training. And you see the similarity with a neural network. So these are gonna be affine and dense operations. Affine in the sense that we keep the size of the matrices and we're just performing matrix, matrix, and matrix vector multiplications. So uh, this is a basic structure. It's a little bit more complicated than a neural network, but you see the overarching philosophy. I think that's the most important thing. And then after the break, we are going to uh, uh, set up the final types of uh, uh, recurrent neural networks, which you can encounter. The first one is gonna be the simple way of training with the back propagation in time. And that is normally what we call the brute force way of doing it. And that has some nice thing due to its simplicity, but it has some, uh, uh, how to say, less positive things because it's gonna be heavy to train and it can actually not be parallelized, essentially because this is a set of sequential operation. And that makes it uh, computationally heavy to train. So if you think your neural network code is taking a lot of time, an RNN takes much, much more time to train properly. So this is actually where we have the difference between Google's DeepMind and what we are doing here, that Google's DeepMind actually has a massive budget where most of the time is spent on training. That's a big difference between us developing algorithms and using them and let's say Google's DeepMind project or OpenAI, because they have tons of resources to for training the model. And that's actually the, as you've seen in your neural network code, this is the bottleneck, the training. So the more resources you have, the more complex models you can train. Should we take a small break guys and just be back in 15 minutes? There's coffee up here. That okay? Any questions in the meantime? Okay, let's take a small break then. Huh? Yeah, there's a question. You can think of that as a time, yeah. But you 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 don't need to think of uh, this T as a time. This is, if you think of uh, natural language processing, this could actually be bits and pieces you give of a, of a sentence, and then you have to construct the rest of the sentence. So it doesn't need to be time. It could be you having made measurements or calculations uh, at a given approximation, and then you have uh, discrete steps between the different approximations. It could be the number of particles or whatever. And then you would like to extrapolate to an infinite number of particles. So then you could use actually this RNNs as a more complicated way to extrapolate the results which you have. So normally you can never deal with infinities, but you would like to extrapolate this to very large numbers. So you could think of you having observations for a given set of numbers, and then you use that to extrapolate and make a prediction. So that would be, so it doesn't need, ah, there it comes. Okay, let me 
So when we now look at uh, this uh, recurrent neural network and we see all these parameters here, uh, there are clearly uh, problems. And one of the problems is that if we now want to do this at every step here, that is going to require a lot of memory. So there is a, a simplification of that, which is called weight sharing. So you can share some of the weights at different time steps. Well, alternatively, if you don't do that, you can easily risk that the dimensionality will explode. So if you have a, a weight matrix of dimensionality 100 times 100 in every step, then clearly that, and you have many time steps, then you will require a lot of memory to store these quantities, especially when you take derivatives. But if we now look at the network, which we have, you see the parameters we need to train. So that means that when we are setting up the back propagation, we need to take the derivatives of the weights of the matrix U, the matrix W, and the matrix V, and then the same for the biases uh, B and C, which we have here. So if we want to uh, set up the network here, the way it's going to look like is now as follows. So I'm going to uh, put up just this H0 in some ancient time. And this continues. And then it, we reach a given time, which we call HT minus 1. And then we have some input to that one, which is an XT minus 1. This produces an output y t minus one and this is fed into the next one which is h of produces h of t this has my x of t here it produces a new output y of t and this goes into h t plus one and then i have my x t plus one and this continues all the way to some given final time H of N. And we produce an output here. So we have an Y of T plus one. And then we can put a line here where we now feed this result into the cost function. So this one goes in and then we have a cost function of T minus one. We have one at T. We have one at t plus one, et cetera. So the total final loss function or cost function is simply going to be given by the sum of all these guys up to n. And then I have a L of i here. Normally you would not include h zero. And then this receives as an input here, the target values, which we call for t minus one tilde. And then we have a target T here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these values are fed into the cost function, and that means that when I'm setting up the derivatives now, I would need the derivatives of this cost function. Uh, the uh, by 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 uh, uh, taking the derivative of these loss functions at every small individual step. Now, what you see here is a uh, very dense mathematically. Uh, from a floating point uh, operation uh, point of view, because we have uh, tons of matrix matrix multiplication at every single step. Now, this is also when we do the back propagation here. So the back propagation, and I'm going to set up the equation here, is normally done in. Uh, uh, we have a feed forward pass first, so all the weights and the bias are initialized like you did before. This H, which you see, these functions can be a simple neural network. It can be a convolutional neural network, or it can be a complicated neural network with many dense, uh, with many layers. So normally it would be a pretty simple, and in most cases you would have, if you look back at that uh, simple case we had, we had just one single neural network in each step. And the neural network had only 32 nodes. So that was a simple neural network in every stage. So the back propagation, which is done, uh, this is normally called back propagation in time. Let me just take that one. So if we take the back propagation in time, and this is normally called B 
BPP, back propagation in time. That leads to, to a sequential algorithm. And it means that this is an algorithm which is very difficult to parallelize. Actually, you cannot parallelize this because there are the, the previous results depends on the results. Uh, the next, no, the next result depends on the previous results, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can make simplifications to this, and uh, one way to do that is actually to uh, not have a connection with the previous hidden layer. The uh, another way to simplify the calculation here is actually to share the weights, and. Uh, uh, have some weights which are trained up to a given point, and then you just reuse these weights for the next points, or you use the same weights throughout. That's also another possibility. So there are several ways of uh, trying to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So one way to simplify this, so one simplification is the following, which is also used. And this is something which can be parallelized because the operations which you have now, the different time steps, they depend on each other. So that means you cannot run the calculations at a given time step here independent of the previous ones. And that makes it much more complicated. So that means that you would have to uh, actually uh, run this as a very sequential algorithm. So one of the approaches which is often used is not to have this dependence on H1, but simply if you're doing dealing with weight sharing, if you now look at the network here, we would have a cost function. Let's just draw it down, draw it here for a specific stage. So we would have an L T minus one that receives an input of a Y T minus one. And then there is something coming in here. And then we have a, an input here, an x t minus one. Here we have the matrix U, which is need to be defined. We have the matrix V, and this receives an input from a t tilde t minus one. But now, instead of uh, uh, using the, uh, sorry, this should have an h h here, and then we have the x here. So let's just draw this. Uh, circles here. So we have an X of T, an H of T, and then we have a Y of T. X of T plus one, and this just continues. And then we have an H of T plus one. We have a Y of T plus one. And then we have the loss function of T or cost function t plus one, and then we have the inputs here. Now, instead of us, uh, as we did in the previous case, where we would feed this one in, then we don't do that now, but the information which we feed is actually the information uh, on the weights. So if we're now putting up the weights, which we have in the network, so we have a U here. Let me just bring this up to so this, uh, I put this in the wrong place, actually. Okay, so we would have now a uh, matrix U, which we train here, a matrix V, which we train here. And then we have a matrix W, which is then given the links between these ones. And normally if you do weight sharing, these matrices would be the same. They would have the same values. So we would have a U and V here, and this would continue all the way till the final point. And this means that uh, we can actually treat each element separately. And that means that we can parallelize the calculations and run the calculations independently for every time step. But then we don't have the link between the uh, hidden layers in the previous net, in the previous point and the next point. So this is also a possible implementation of these neural networks. So this is easier to train uh, instead of this one, where we would actually have, when we now bring in the weights and the biases, et cetera, we would now have a uh, weight matrix V, U here, a weight matrix V here, 
and then the weight matrix W here, and the same with a W, a U, a V, and then a V of U, and then W here. This becomes much uh, heavier to train because the results in H of T depends on the results in H of T minus one. So this is something which uh, uh, is a simplification, but all of these methods here, they carry a problem and that problem deals with uh, the possibilities of having exploding gradients. So I just wanted to discuss that a little bit and how you can reduce that problem. And one of the recipes for that with exploding gradients is something which is called gradient clipping. And I just wanted to mention it because that's often implemented in recurrent neural networks. So what we need to train now, when you look at the uh, expressions, so for each node, and then I'm thinking at a time t, if we use time to indicate it, it doesn't need to be time then we need to calculate the derivatives. So we would need to calculate for a specific node here, we would need to calculate the derivative of the loss function at that specific time as a function of this matrix U. We would need a derivative as a function of this matrix W. We would need a derivative with respect to V at this specific function here. And then we would also need the derivative of B of LT, and we would need a derivative with respect to these uh, biases B and C here. So these are a set of derivatives which now actually complicate life and we use this uh, back propagation in time. And if we now just look at the, one of these derivatives, so one of the challenges with this kind of training, which is numerical expensive, you know, challenge is exploding or vanishing gradients. And again, what you will see is that we are using the chain rule. So if I take the derivative of, let's say, this L of T with respect to these parameters W, that is going to be given by a D L of T and like we are doing in project uh, number two now, we have the derivative with respect to the output. So I would have a y of t, and this now has the derivative of h of t. So this is nothing but us, just repeating the chain rule, which we are using in project number two. It's the same basic recipe, except that now we have many more derivatives, and that complicates life, and the training becomes more complicated. And then, we would have the chain of uh, all these uh, uh, derivatives from the previous ones. So we would have a sum from k equal one up to n, and then I would have a dh of t and dhk, and then dhk of w here. So this would be the chain of operations which we need to, to calculate them. And, uh, uh, this is typically computed uh, at a as a multiplication of uh, different time steps. So this is uh, actually quite problematic and leads normally to this problem of vanishing gradients. So let's take a look at uh, a simple case which can allow us to understand what can go wrong when we train this as a function of time. So let's look at a simple example. And let's now assume that this H of T is simply given by this matrix W times the weights, no, the, the output of the layer in no, the, at the, the, the hidden layer at the time T minus one. And what we are going to assume now is also the following. So we assume that this W is the same for all previous time. for all previous times. What that means is that I can actually write this H of T, I can write that as a function uh, of uh, all these different Ws which are applied T times, starting with H zero. So I'm actually having this T times 
So what I'm having then is actually a W of T to the power of T times H zero. Okay, this is just a simple application. And we are now assuming that we just leave out the other things like the matrix V and the matrix U, et cetera, because one of the gradients is gonna be this one. So we need to calculate the gradient with respect to W, with respect to V, with respect to U, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look at that function, which you have, suppose now that we can diagonalize W, and this is just meant as an example on what can happen if the gradients explodes. So suppose W is diagonalizable. Diagonalizable. So that means that the, there is some kind of unitary transformation or orthogonal transformations, which give us the, uh, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of W. So that means that this W, uh, I can transform that one into a diagonal form. So I can have a orthogonal matrix, U of T multiplied with W multiplied with U, which is equal to a diagonal matrix. So this is just an assumption I'm making about this matrix. Now, what I can do next is actually to expand this H zero in terms of the uh, eigenvalues of uh, the matrix W. So my next uh, assumption I make now is to expand this H zero, because now I have a matrix which I have diagonalized. I have a basis, which is an orthogonal basis. And this orthogonal basis can be used to express another function. So expand H O in terms of the eigenvectors of this matrix W in terms of eigenvectors. And I'm going to call these eigenvectors simply for little w of i. And then it has eigenvalues. And I'm just gonna call these eigenvalues lambda of i. So it means that uh, when I look at H0, I can rewrite that one in terms of these uh, eigenvectors multiplied with a coefficient which needs to be determined. And then we also know that when I act on with this matrix on wi, this is the same as a lambda of i times wi, okay? So the next thing I do now is simply to perform the first step, h1 is equal to w times h0. So essentially this is what we end up doing in a neural network, right? And you can actually use this analysis here also in the analysis of a neural network and see why gradients can explode. If you then assume that your neural network has the same weights throughout. This is just an assumption we make, but then you can easily see how the gradients can explode. So what happens then is that if we do this, this is the same as the sum of i of alpha of i, and then I have w multiplied with omega of i, and that gives us a simple sum, which is in terms of these eigenvalues of alpha of i, and alpha of i are just unknown coefficients. Now, the next thing, uh, if we repeat this t times, then I will get the result a given time t. So I would get h of t then, which is simply w of t multiplied with h zero. And if I do that, what I get is a sum of i, the same coefficients alpha of i, but now I have lambda of i to the power of t multiplied with w of i. So this product can vanish or it can explode. And it can vanish depending on the size of the eigenvectors of the matrix W. This kind of analysis uh, is something some of you may have seen in connection with random matrices and Markov chains. Has anyone seen that similar analysis? This is often used to, if you have a random matrix, the largest eigenvalue is one. 
So that means that if a Markov chain converges, it converges when you have when W is a stochastic matrix, which simply means that the column vectors sum to one. If it's a stochastic matrix, it converges, if it converges, it converges to the largest eigenvalue when you have a Markov chain. And the largest eigenvalue of a stochastic matrix is one. And that's the one which will dominate the result. If you have a degeneracies, then convergence of a Markov chain is lost. Okay, so if you now, that was just a small digression. So if you now look at this, the, uh, uh, what you have now is that everything which you do depends uh, on the eigenvalues. So you could now assume that lambda zero, suppose now that we have ordered the matrix like this and up to some lambda of n. And the matrix uh, now, it means that it would, or the result which we have, this h of t then, would then be proportional to, this is the largest value, this is the one which dominates when you do this many, many times of uh, lambda zero, uh, or lambda zero multiplied with the eigenvector zero, and that would if it, if its own coefficients. And then you see clearly that the if this lambda zero is larger than one, then the gradients can explode. And this leads to problems with exploding gradients. Uh, on the other hand, if this lambda, if lambda zero is smaller than one, we can have, can lead to vanishing gradients. One of the uh, simplest approaches to actually avoid exploding gradients is something which is called gradient clipping. And that's a technique which you probably may have read about in the textbook by Goodfellow and company because they have a discussion of gradient clipping. So gradient clipping is one of the ways by which we can reduce gradient clipping. Let me, gradient clipping. can be used to avoid exploding gradients. Now for the other cases, I mean, one of the ways to do that is actually to adjust the biases when you have vanishing gradients. But this gradient clipping is actually a technique which is pretty simple to implement. And suppose now that the gradient is something we define as uh, this vector g. Then, if the norm of this vector g is small, is larger than this is a norm two, is larger than a specific number epsilon which we have fixed. Then, what we would do then is simply to redefine the gradient by taking this number epsilon and divide it by g, the norm two here and then multiply it with G. And that is the typical approach which is used in gradient clipping. But you see what can go wrong here. When you have a network like a, a, a recurrent neural network and you do this many, many times, you can actually risk that the gradient can explode because you see that these new values can become larger and larger and larger. And when we are taking the, the derivatives of a pretty large number, there is a risk. It may not be zero, or it may not explode, but it can actually become very large. So from that simple analysis, you get a feeling of what can go wrong. And this gradient clipping is a simple trick which is often used in the training here. Now, there are some other technicalities which uh, pertain to these uh, uh, neural uh, networks, so these recurrent neural networks. And that is that they depend on inputs at all times. So at every time there is a new input to the network. And that means that the weights need to be updated. So one technique is actually to impose weight sharing, but clearly you could allow the weights to change over time as well. For every time step you have a new input. And uh, 
one of the challenges with these uh, networks is actually to learn these long-term dependencies. And in order to train them, you would actually need all these internal values in memory until you get to the back propagation stage. So if you look at the network here, the graphical representation here, what you would need then is actually, if you want to train all the weights, you would have to use a lot of memory to store the information about the weights and the biases at every time step. And in particular, if you have lots of data, like the simple example I showed you with a, a thousand data points, it means that for every point, you would actually store the weights and the biases which you have uh, trained. So this is obviously a big challenge. Uh, so you would do that till you get to the back propagation gradients. And then a solution is often used is to stop at some point uh, when it comes to memory. And that means to use then the same weights again and again. So when you have trained the weights for this use, so you would train them up to a certain point, and then you would use it for the remaining points. That is a common strategy which is being used in recurring neural networks. Uh, the disadvantage then is that you may not be able to actually keep this kind of long time dependencies because a network, if you have trained it over long times, there will be dependencies which can span over long, long times. And that is obviously another problem. And there are ways to adjust that. So there's a lot of fiddling in this field here. Uh, I showed you the simple RNNs. And then with a, the simple RNN is just a brute force approach. You just train weights and biases step by step. You do the back propagation. Uh, you can uh, simplify that one and in order to parallelize the code where you can then train the uh, weights uh, from one layer to the next one and just use the same weights. And then you can actually update the different times individual independently. Alternatively, there is something which I've uh, put in the notes here, which is a way to deal with that, which is called the long short term memory, which is a way to set up the different uh, uh, hidden layers. Uh, there's another one, which is called a gated recurrent neural network. So these are all kinds of ways to try to incorporate the long-term memory dependencies, which may exist in such a network without the hassle of having to do the back propagation through all the elements. So these are considerations which you should keep in mind. Uh, if you're gonna use uh, recurrent neural networks uh, for the final project, if you want to test that, I would normally just recommend using TensorFlow and then just start with a simple RNN and just see how that functions. Uh, in the lecture notes, you will find examples on where you use this long short, long short term memory uh, option. Uh, there are also examples and discussions of it, but that is something which goes a little bit beyond on what we will do in this course. So uh, summarizing what you see here is that you have uh, networks which you can train for different cases so a normal feed-forward neural network is something you could apply to anything you want in principle. You could actually use that one to train a differential equation. So if you have the output for a differential equation, you could simply use the input from the previous step as an input to a network and then use the output as an output you train. So you could actually set up a neural network for each time step. Alternatively, for such equations, you can use a recurrent neural network and use the back propagation in time. That's another possibility. And then you have different variants of that. If you have big images, you can still use a neural network if you want to, but then the dimensionality quickly explodes. And that's where convolutional neural networks become important because then you would filter out the dimensionalities and reduce the dimensionality of the object you want to reproduce and train. And then you can simply use convolution as a mathematical operation to perform the filtering. So depending on what you want to do, uh, you have three very popular methods, which are very powerful and allow you to train uh, both super, especially supervised data, but you can actually use neural networks also on 
unsupervised learning, where you actually generate new data. So that's also possible. But in general, these methods are all used on uh, uh, supervised learning cases. That's the most common uh, application, which means that you have data which have been labeled, or you know what they mean. Like in this case, you have a specific input, you know the value of that. You have measured a specific output at a given time. You know what that value should be. So that would be a case of a labeled uh, data set. You run an experiment over time, and each day you run the experiment, you have a specific input and a specific output. And that means that these data are well known. And then you would try to train a network to reproduce this data. So that would be a recorded neural network. So I hope you see the uh, versatility of these methods, but also the similarities. So a recurrent neural network just uses a backpropagation. The complication is that you have to step back in time at every time step and update the weights and the biases. But the algorithm is essentially you applying a repeated usage of the chain rule, nothing but that. And then we have the problem that in, since we're doing this many, many times, we can easily end up in a situation where the gradients explode. So next week, uh, this ends uh, the deep learning part of this course. Uh, I, at the end of the semester, we'll mention other courses you can follow if you want to apply these methods and study them in more depth. But next week, we uh, are going back to the pre-deep revolution method, methods and the ones with, with the, the pre-deep learning revolution methods. It's too many words. And we are going to look at an extremely popular algorithm, decision trees, which is like the game we played with our parents when we were kids, we were sitting in the car and uh, you would say, guess something. And then you had 20 questions to decide what this was, right? So you got these chains of yes and no's till you nailed it down. And a decision tree is, is very similar to that. It's extremely powerful. It's very intuitive to understand it. And then you can make many trees and then you have random forests, you can grow them. And then you can uh, put as, uh, assemblies of uh, similar trees. So random forests would be a forest of different trees. A uh, bagging method is just a collection of the same trees, boring fir trees or pine trees or whatever. And then you have boosting. And gradient boosting is one of these methods which has been winning many classification competitions in the last years. And these are, methods which are intuitively very simple and there is actually not that much mathematics in them and they they're very powerful and these are going to be the last methods we discuss also because gradient methods gradient boosting methods are methods which are widely used in the community but they still belong to what we might call the pre-deep revolution methods so this will keep us busy the last two weeks and uh, and then it's sadly over Okay, guys, I'm going to stop here. And then uh, uh, we see each other at the lab. So next week, the lab, uh, I'm going to present project number three during the weekend. But I guess that most of you will be trying to polish the report for project number two during the lab sessions. Okay, best wishes to you all and happy weekend and see you soon.